a game that redefined the scope of storytelling and presentation within the industry, Metal Gear Solid. Consider a classic and one of the best games of all time created by the industry genius Hideo Kojima for the PlayStation 1. But the path to build Metal Gear Solid was one that changed throughout its development, from moving development through different platforms to developing a successful formula and translating a classic 2D franchise into the third dimension. Today on Gaming History, we'll be looking at the history of Metal Gear Solid. 1994, an era where the advent of 3D gaming was coming into clear focus, with PCs, the SNES, to even the 32X add-on offering it to an extent. During that very year, one of Konami's top directors, Hideo Kojima, was busy with his latest game, Police Knots, a visual novel-like adventure game for the PC 9821. Seeing this very clear direction the industry was going, Kojima started to plan out his next game, a return to Metal Gear. At this point, three Metal Gear games existed on the market. Metal Gear for the MSX and the NES, Metal Gear 2 for the MSX, and the spin-off Snake's Revenge for the NES, which was not made by Kojima. Kojima's intent to return to the franchise was one that he knew he had to return to, as it was his breakout game, and wished to better evolve the stealth mechanic in the third dimension. All of them were top-down 2D stealth games, and like with many other series that were being challenged to bring their 2D series to 3D, this was Kojima's new challenge that started planning while in mid-development of Police Knots. Initially, he was planning for the game to be a remake of the first Metal Gear on the MSX, but decided ultimately on a sequel called Metal Gear 3. Police Knots, while it was being developed for the PC9821, had plans to also port the game on one of the earliest 3D consoles on the market, the 3DO. Having to already be working on this console, Kojima's Metal Gear 3 was as such also now being planned for it. In fact, with Konami releasing a demo disc for Police Knots called Pilot Disc, it contained concept art for Kojima's next game already. These included an early take on the series lead Solid Snake, a new female character called Meryl Silverberg, who also happened to be a character in Police Knots, and a very early look at a group of intimidating figures known as Foxhound. However, while all this was happening, Sony had also revealed their new console, the PlayStation, being a fully robust 3D console with large storage and a lot of potential. Kojima was impressed by this very machine, and by 1995, the ill-fated 3DO was not performing well at all, and looked like it would collapse any day now. As such, Kojima and Konami decided to shift the game to this very new console, the PlayStation. Kojima, who had promised himself to make this new Metal Gear for it, worked to port Police Knots once more to this very console, a good way of learning the ropes with developing for it. But soon by mid-1995, full-on development for this new Metal Gear 3 began, with a team of only 20 people, which would be considered an oddity for what Konami was pending as a major project. But it was what Kojima preferred, as he could better work with such a small team and better tell his team's condition. However, the game was soon retitled as Metal Gear Solid. This was all due to the fact that Metal Gear 1 and 2 weren't very well-known games in the West, with two in fact staying exclusively on the MSX in Japan. The usage of Solid in place, while obviously a nod to the series' protagonist, was also Kojima's push for the direction the series was going in, the third dimension. But alas, this was all about to happen during the transition of 2D to 3D in the market, where a series either saw themselves flourish to new heights not ever seen before, such as Super Mario 64, or go into an absolute blunder, like Konami's other series Castlevania did in transition. As such, Kojima had a tough feat to make sure it transitioned smoothly. Being a series that utilized guns, first person was an idea that came up to better present the 3D nature of the game. But being that this was a stealth game, it was deemed too hard to control. As such, the idea was quite simple. Take the formula of Metal Gear 2 and make it 3D. In other words, the camera would stay overhead for a bulk of the action, meanwhile switching to more angled or even first-person perspectives on occasion to better showcase the 3D world. This all being planned by Kojima's ingenious plan of using Lego blocks and action figures to model the game's various maps, to see how the camera would look and plan accordingly. 
and that was the idea that Kojima and the team wanted to present, a believable three-dimensional world, with Kojima even stating, if the player isn't tricked into believing that the world is real, then there's no point in making the game. To fulfill this, adjustments were made to every detail, such as individually designed desks. In other words, making it accurate to real-life physics. Whether it be enemies seeing Snake in their cone of vision, to even being able to hear him knock on walls or walk on metal. This even came down to the game's weaponry, which Kojima hired a weapons expert by the name of Motosada Mori as technical advisor to better hone their research. This going so far as to even visiting Stanbridge Gun Rentals and Fort Erin, and even going further over the top by working with the Huntington Beach SWAT team in order to better understand weapons, vehicles, and even explosives through demonstration. With the world at work, Hideo Kojima had tasked artist Yoji Shinkawa, who had earlier drawn those very concept pieces found in the download disc of Police Knots, to now design the characters, weapons, and of course Metal Gear itself. Much as how Kojima and the level designers were using LEGO to build the maps in real life, Shinkawa used plastic bottles to build props and hardware of the game before drawing them out, let alone making clay models of these very characters that he'd provide to the model artists afterwards. For Solid Snake himself, Konami didn't wish for Snake to look as old as he did in his previous iterations, as that might not be such an easy sell to an audience of young gamers. As such, for this new iteration of Solid Snake in his 30s, they based his face on a young iteration of actor Christopher Walken, while his physique was based on John claude Van Damme. And this connection to utilizing Hollywood actors as a basis went back to Hideo Kojima's obsession with films. This all being thanks to his family who made it a tradition to watch one movie a night and wouldn't go to bed until the movie was over. And with Kojima having just worked on two rather drama-focused games including Police Knots and Snatcher, Kojima felt freshly inspired to deliver a game that would play out like a movie. The plot of Metal Gear 1 and 2 dealt with Solid Snake sneaking into the then serious villain Big Boss's hideouts. This time, Kojima was interested in reviving a scrap story he had planned for Metal Gear 2 that involved a rogue US Special Forces taking control of a nuke on US soil, but hadn't executed it at the time because he felt it was too unrealistic. This time, being that it was 6 years after the Cold War, he felt that enough time had passed to bring the story back. The story involved Solid Snake coming back from retirement to infiltrate the Shadow Moses base in Alaska, which hadn't compromised by his old Special Forces team that he had been a part of in the previous game, Foxhound, this time contending with a counterpart to him known as Liquid Snake as the lead villain. This along with a number of returning and new cast members to tell a rich and unexpected story. And if you're enjoying this video, please hit that subscribe button and hit the like button too to further support us and keep creating new videos. And so, with development deep at hand, the September Tokyo Game Show rolled around in 1996. The first one ever, actually. This had many developers from across Japan showing off their latest games in development, including Squaresoft's Final Fantasy VII, Capcom's Resident Evil 2, and of course, Konami's Metal Gear Solid. Unlike most video game trailers, this was presented very differently. In many ways, like a movie trailer, with emphasis on cinematics, high quality editing, and even ending on a movie inspired credits. A clear influence from Kojima's vision for the game. The trailer itself, however, appeared more as a concept CGI trailer rather than actual gameplay footage, as this looked better than anything in the final game, with higher poly models, lighting that bounced off of surroundings including this highly polished glowing sword of the ninja, and the reflection off his mask at that, as well as even texture blurring. Features that weren't possible on the PlayStation at all. On top of that, the menus looked rather different, more prevalent and larger, while the Kodak calls were all done in real time with Snake needing to clearly hide in a corner. A concept that could have made it both harder for the player, but also harder for the developers to make an excuse for Snake to be hidden to answer Kodaks on the fly. This all likely running on an engine on PC at the time before being ported to a PlayStation friendly engine. Other obvious differences seen here included the lack of decoy octopus amongst the members of Foxhound. Vulcan Raven spelt as Valken Raven, a rather early and simpler version of the armory floor of the tank hangar, and the radar appearing differently too. And while the Tokyo Game Show showed a rather cinematic game, 
The animations had been rather simple at that point. However, the plans for the final game was going to include a lot of exaggerated jumps and actions. So rather than going to someone to motion capture the characters, they opted for animators with experience in anime design to manually animate everyone. A tough but required feat here. But at this point, it was clear the game was becoming a major project at Konami, and 20 people weren't cutting it anymore. In fact, there was literally only one programmer available to work in this case. A ludicrous feat. This even leading to unintentional results, such as the camouflage of the ninja being due to a programming bug. One well, that did work in their favor in the end. But even so, the team was forced to expand at this point to get to the finish line of late 1997. And so, with this revamped team, they start to work hard on building the game in a proper PlayStation compatible engine, and by E3 1997, the first true in-game trailer of the game was shown off, showing off a lengthy 5 minute trailer, and in Hideo Kojima fashion, showing it once more like a movie trailer. Here actually showing off various areas from all parts of the game, including crawling, sticking to walls, and combat amongst the many features. As well, we now see the final version of the armory floor. Most prominently was a number of first-person mechanics shown off too. An interesting feat as many PlayStation 1 games at the time used pre-rendered backgrounds and made this ability impossible. But this was one game that had fully 3D areas to enable cinematic cutscenes and first-person viewing, all ending in a spectacular explosion of numerous C4 set up by Snake in the game. There were also some differences here too, including a more controllable camera, blue vision cones for the enemies as opposed to the final yellow ones, the life bar being more in the middle of the screen, a simpler radar along with Snake's endless ammunition, while the first trailer went somewhat under the radar, this one was getting all sorts of media attention and positivity, going over the emphasis on stealth and strategy displayed in the trailer to the very fully 3D environments shown off for a PlayStation game, let alone the movie-like presentation. Kojima was very surprised by this. While his old Metal Gear games did make much of a splash in the West, this was becoming a major breakout hit for him, and so he increased his expectations of the game's performance in North America. While the game was very deep in development, and much of the game looked very close to its final iteration, the game was now delayed to September 1998, a near whole year. And during this time, a bulk of voice and music work were being prepared. The game being as cinematic as it was, was tend to have full voice acting from top to bottom. A major reason why this disc was so useful here. Of course, this was also at the time when Konami wasn't exactly amazing at recording strong voice work, and so much of the audio came out as rather low quality, and even echoey, indicating that the game may not have even been recorded in a soundproof room. While the Japanese and other language voice cast was said to be credited as normal, the English voice cast was forced to use pseudonyms, as it was unknown if the game was going to be allowed under the Screen Actors Guild. The only person to keep their real name in was the protagonist's very voice actor, David Hayter. A figure that only grows more prominent as the franchise grows. Meanwhile, the music of the game was being made by several in-house Konami musicians. Kojima, as with the rest of the game, wished for a more cinematic score, but with a more powerful track. And so a mix of moody synthetic tracks were introduced for stealth segments with string instruments for more tense moments. This along with high action themes for combat. Along with a lyrical track to serve as the game's central song. The best is yet to come. And while development continued, constant footage of the game was being shown off to build hype around this upcoming masterpiece. By March 1998, the Tokyo Game Show rolled around, and this time the game even had a playable demo ready. And to build further upon the hype, Konami started a robust $8 million marketing campaign. These included the usual magazine and television ads, which most famously, the American one, boiled down to this. Sir, aren't these tests kinda easy? Suicide mission. Oh. As well as store kiosk demos and even giving away demos of the game. And while Kojima wished to further implement other features into the game, including the ability to hide bodies in storage compartments, or even just further interactions with surrounding objects and environments, it was something he couldn't get in. This likely being due to a PlayStation limitation, but it also might have been a deadline issue as well. This was something that would have to wait till a later entry. The game was scheduled to release in under two months after its Japanese release in North America. For this, localizer Jeremy Blaustein was put in charge of this. 
Kojima stayed rather independent of this part, which led to Jeremy making several liberties to the original script. Some were fairly straightforward, such as localizing wireless to Kodak. Others made some lines sound a bit too goofy. Once Kojima learned of this, he was furious about the liberties he took, and after this game, wished to never work with him again. However, Jeremy Blaustein to this day does still believe that his script is what made the game so popular in the West. But that is something that is up for debate. Aside from the script, other small gameplay changes were made for the West too, including the addition of an extreme difficulty, a bonus tuxedo outfit for Snake, and a demo theater for viewing the cutscenes of the game. And so the game released in Japan on September 3rd, 1998 and October 20th, 1998 in North America. The game was a massive critical success, scoring near perfect and perfect scores across the board, many including PlayStation Official Magazine declaring it as the best game ever made and winning numerous Game of the Year awards, even with competition being as stiff as they were, being that they were up against Nintendo's Zelda Ocarina of Time. While up to this point video games felt like video games, many were speaking of it almost like it was a movie, with computer and video gamers even declaring it as playing a big budget action blockbuster, but only better. Some even bringing up how it basically invented or even reinvented the stealth genre as a whole. And aside from its critical success, it was also a massive commercial success too, going on to selling 7 million copies, standing in the top 10 best-selling PlayStation games, just above Crash Bandicoot and under Tomb Raider. The Metal Gear franchise had now been successfully revived, and Hideo Kojima's name was now cemented as a top genius in the industry, along the lines of other such figures, including Hironobu Sakaguchi, Shinji Mikami, and even Shigeru Miyamoto. Eventually, the game even saw an updated version released in Japan, called Metal Gear Solid Integral, that was basically the English version with the additions it had received, but as well came with an additional disc for playing 300 extra VR missions. That disc, however, released in North America as its own standalone release, called Metal Gear Solid VR Missions. The game's legacy continued on, with even a PC port coming, to eventually even seeing a re-release in a Metal Gear Solid collection on the PlayStation 2, appearing several times on PSN stores, and as of this video, even appearing on the Metal Gear Solid Master Collection. This topped with the game eventually seeing a controversial remake in 2004. But going back, Kojima was nowhere near as done with the series yet, as evident with the post credit scene of the game, and as such started planning a sequel right away, with design documents ready as soon as January 1999 for Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty for the upcoming PlayStation 2. A game that could be said to have built even greater hype, and a game with an even larger controversy around it, a game that I plan to cover soon, so hit the subscribe button for I plan to be back with more Metal Gear and other gaming history soon. Hit the like button and comment below on what was your favorite moment in the original Metal Gear Solid. So everyone, thank you for watching!